Yet, so far hath discretion fought with nature, that we with wiser sorrow think on him together with remembrance of ourselves. Therefore, our sometime sister, now our queen, the imperial jointress to this warlike state, have we as twere with a defeated joy, with an auspicious and a dropping eye, with mirth and funeral and with dirge and marriage, an equal scale weighing delight and dole, taken to wife. your better wisdoms, which have freely gone with this affair along. For all, our thanks. And now, Laertes, what's the news with you? You told us of some suit. What is it, Laertes? You cannot speak of reason to the Dane and lose your voice. My dread lord, your leave in favor to return to France, from whence though willingly I came to Denmark to show my duty in your coronation. <laughs> Yet now that duty done, I do wish again to go back to France and bow it to your gracious leave and pardon. Have you your father's leave? What says Polonius? He hath, my lord, wrung from me my slow leave, by laborsome petition, and at last, upon his will, I sealed my hard consent. I do beseech you give him leave to go. Take thy fair hour, Laertes. Time be thine, and thy best graces spend it at thy will. But now, my cousin Hamlet, and my son. A little more than kin and less than kind. How is it that the clouds still hang on you? Not so, my lord. I am too much in the sun. Good Lord, cast thy night of power off. Let thine eye look like a friend on Denmark. Do not forever let thy veil of lids seek for thy noble father in the dust. Thou knowest tis common. All the lids must die, passing through nature to eternity. I madam, it is common. If it be, why seems it so particular with thee? Seems, madam. Nay, it is, I know not seems. Tis not alone my inky cloak, good mother, nor customary suit of solid black, no, nor the fruitful river in the eye, nor the dejected behavior of the visage, together with all forms, moods, shapes of grief, that can denote me truly. These indeed seem, for they are actions that a man might play, but I have that within which passeth show, these but the trappings and the suits of woe. It is sweet and commendable in your nature, Hamlet, to give these mourning duties to your father. But you must know, your father lost a father. That father lost, lost his, and the survivor bound in filial obligation for some term to do obsequious sorrow. But to persevere in obstinate condolement is a course of impious stubbornness. Tis unmanly grief. Shows a will most incorrect to heaven, heart unfortified, a mind impatient, an understanding simple and unschooled. For what we know must be, and is as common as any of the most vulgar thing to sense, why should we, in our peevish opposition, take it to heart? Fight, tis a fault against heaven, fault against the dead, fault of nature, to reason most absurd, whose common theme is death of fathers, and who still hath cried from the first course till he that died today. This must be so. We pray you throw to earth this unprevailing woe, and think of us as of a father. For let the world take note, you are the most immediate to our throne, and with no less nobility of love than that which dearest father bears his son, do I impart toward you. For your intent to going back to school in Wittenberg, it is most retrograde to our desire, and we beseech you, and you to remain here in the cheering comfort of our eye, our chiefest courtier, cousin, and our son. Let not thy mother lose her prayers, Hamlet. I pray thee, stay with us. Go not to Wittenberg. I shall, in all my best, obey you, madam. Why, it is a loving and fair reply. Be as ourself in Denmark, madam, come. This gentle and unforced accord of Hamlet sits smiling to my heart. Come away! Into a satyr, 
so loving to my mother that it might not but tune the winds of heaven and visit her face too roughly. Oh, heaven and earth must have remembered why she would hang on him, as if increase of appetite had grown by what it fed on. And yet, within a month, let me not think on it. Frailty, thy name is woman! Within a month, or ere those shoes were old with which she followed my poor father's body. Like Niobe, all tears, why she, even she, oh God, a beast that wants this course of reason would have mourned longer, married my uncle, my father's brother, but no more like my father than I to Hercules. Within a month, ere yet the salt of most unrighteous tears had left the flushing in her galled eyes, she married, oh most wicked speed to post with such dexterity to incest with sheets, it is not. Where it cannot come to good but break my heart. For I must hold my tongue. Hail to your lordship. Horatio! I'm glad to see thee well, or I can forgive myself. I say, my lord, your poor servant. Oh, uh, sir, my good friend! I'll change that name with you. You won't make it from Wittenberg, Horatio. Marcellus! My good lord. I'm glad to see thee well. Good evening, sir. But. What in faith make you from Wittenberg? A true on disposition, dear my lord. I would not hear your any say so. I know you are no truant. But what is your affair in Elsinore? My lord, I came to see your father's funeral. I prithee do not mock me, fellow student. I think it was to see my mother's wedding. Indeed, my lord, it followed hard upon. Thrift, thrift, Horatio. The funeral baked meats did coldly furnish forth the marriage tables. Would I had met my dearest foe in heaven or ever I had seen that day, Horatio. My father, he thinks I see my father. Where, my lord? In my mind's eye, Horatio. I saw him once. He was a goodly king. He was a man. Take him for all in all. I shall not look upon his like again. My lord, I think, I think I saw him yesterday. You saw who? My lord, the king, your father. King, my father, seizing your admiration for a while, with an attempt to hear till I may deliver upon the witness of these gentlemen this marvel to you. For God's love, let me hear. Two nights together had these gentlemen, Marcellus and Bernardo, on their watch in the dead vast in the middle of the night, been thus encountered a figure just like your father, armed at point exactly, cap a pay, appears before them, and with solemn march goes slow and stately by them. Thrice he walked by their oppressed and fear surprised eyes, within his truncheon's length, whilst they distilled, almost to jelly with the act of fear. Stand dumb and speak not to him. This to me in dreadful secrecy in part they did, and I with them the third night kept the watch. Whereas they delivered, both in time, form of the thing, each word made true and good. The apparition comes. I knew your father, these hands are not more alike. But where was this? My lord, upon the platform over lodge. Did you not speak to it? I did, my lord, but answer made it none. Oh, tis very strange. As I do live, my honored lord, tis true. And we did think it writ down in our duty to let you know of it. Indeed. Indeed, sirs, but this troubles me. Hold you the watch tonight. We do, my lord. Arm, say you. Arm, my lord. From top to toe. My lord, from head to foot. Saw you not his face? Oh, yes, my lord, he wore his beaver up. What, looked he frowningly? A countenance more in sorrow than in anger. Pale or red? Nay, very pale. And fixed his eyes upon you. Most constantly. I would I had been there. They would have much amazed you. Very like. Very like. I will watch tonight. Perchance it will walk again. I warrant it will. If it is soon my noble father's person, I'll speak to it. Though hell itself should gape and bid me hold my peace. I pray you all, if you have hitherto concealed this sight, let it be tenable in your silence still. And whatsoever else shall have tonight, give it an understanding. But no tongue. I will requite your loves. So fare you well. Upon the platform took us eleven and twelve. I'll visit you. Our duty to your honor. My father's spirit in arms? All is not well. I doubt some foul play. With the night were come, till then sit still my soul. Foul deeds will rise, and all the earth overwhelm them to men's eyes. Mine is a 
Sarah's own bar. Farewell, sister. And as the winds get benefit and convoys assistant, do not sleep, but let me hear from you. Do you doubt that? For Hamlet in the trifling is favor, a little fashion, a toy in blood, youth in its privy nature, forward, not permanent, sweet, not lasting, the perfume and suppliance of a minute no more. No more but so. Think it no more. Perhaps he loves you now, and no soil nor coddle doth besmirch the virtue of his will. But you must fear his greatness weighed, his will is not his own, for he himself is subject to his birth. He may not, as unvalued persons do, carve for himself, for on his choice depends the safety and health of this whole estate. Then weigh what loss your honor may sustain, if with too great an ear you listen to his song. Or you lose your heart, or your chaste treasures open to his unmastered infertility. Fear it, Ophelia, fear it, my dear sister, and keep it in the rear of your affection, out of shock of danger and desire. I shall the effect of this good lesson keep as watchman to my heart. But good, my brother, do not as some ungracious pastors do. Show me the steep and thorny way to heaven, while like a puffed and reckless libertine, himself the primrose pass of dalliance treads, and wrecks not his own race. Oh, fear me not. But say, my father comes, occasion smiles upon a second thee. Yet here, Laertes, aboard, aboard for shame. The wind sits in the shoulder of your sail, and you're stayed for it. There, my blessing with thee. And these few precepts in thy memory, look thou character. <laughs> Give thy thoughts no tongue, nor any unproportioned thought his act. Be thou familiar, familiar, but by no means vulgar. Those friends thou hast, and their adoption tried, grapple them unto thy soul with hoops of steel. Neither a borrower nor a lender be. be. For loan off loses both itself and friend, and borrowing dulls the edge of husbandry. This above all, to thine own self be true. And it must follow, as the night the day, thou canst not then be false to any man. Farewell. My blessing season this in thee. Most humbly do I take my leave, my lord. The time invites you. Go. Your servants tend. Farewell, Ophelia, and remember well what I have said to you. Tis in my memory locked, and you yourself will keep the key of it. Farewell. What is it, Ophelia, he hath said to you? So please you something touching the Lord Hamlet. Mary, well be thought. Tis told me he hath very oft of late given private time to you, and you have of your audience been most free and bounteous. If it be so, as so tis put on me, and that way of caution, I must warn you. You do not understand yourself so clearly as it behooves my daughter and your honor. What is between you? Give me up the truth. My lord, he hath of late made many tenders of his affection to me. Affection? Pooh! You speak like a green girl, and sift in such perilous circumstance. Do you believe his tenders, as you so call them? I do not know, my lord, what I should think. <laughs> Mary, I will teach you. Think yourself a baby, that you have taken these tenders for true pay, which are not sterling. Tender yourself more dearly, or, not to crack the wind of the poor phrase, we're ending it thus, you'll tender me a fool. My lord, he hath imparted on me with love in the most honorable fashion. Aye, fashion you may call it. Go to have been countless for the most all of the holy vows of heaven. Aye, springes to catch woodcocks. I do know, when the blood burns, how prodigal the soul lends the tongue vows. These blazes, daughter, giving more light than heat, extinct in both, even in their promise, as it is a making, you must not take for fire. From this time forth, be something scanter of your maiden presence. Say your entreatments at a higher rate than a command to parley. For Lord Hamlet, believe so much in him that he is young, and with a larger tether may he walk, they may be given you. In few, Ophelia, do not believe his vows. This is for all. I would not, in plain terms, from this time forth, have you so slander any moment leisure as to give words or talk with the Lord Hamlet. Look to it, I charge you, come your ways. I shall obey, my lord. Dear my true duty, tis very cold. It is a nipping and eager air. What hour now? I think it lacks a twelve. No, it has struck. Indeed? I heard it not. It then draws near the season wherein the spirit held us wont to walk. Look, my lord, it comes! Angels and ministers of grace defend us! Be thou spirit of health, or goblin damned! Bring with thee airs from heaven, or blast from hell! Be thy intents wicked or charitable, that thou comes in such a questionable shape, that I'll speak to thee, I'll call thee, Hamlet, King, Father, Royal Day, no answer me! 
They package you to go away with it. But do not go with it. Don't bite on me. You will not speak. No, no, follow it. You shall not go, my lord. Why would you be a fear? I do not set my life at a pin's feet. You will lose my soul. Go. What can it do to that thing a thing as immortal as itself? Wait before you get on, follow it. You shall not go, my lord. Hold up your hands. By heaven, the make it ghost of him that lets me. I say, wait, go on. I'll follow thee. He waxes desperate with imagination. Let's follow. Tis not fit thus to obey. Have after to what issue will this come? Something is rotten in the state of Denmark. Heaven will direct it. Nay, let's follow. Whither wilt thou lead me? Speak! I'll go no further. Mark me. I will. My hour is almost come. I the sulfurous and tormenting flames must render up myself. Alas, poor ghost! Pity me not, but let thy serious hearing to what I shall unfold. Speak, I am bound to hear. So art thou to revenge when thou shalt hear. What? I am thy father's spirit, doomed for a certain term to walk the night, and for the day confined to fast and fires till the foul crimes done in my days of nature are burnt and purged away. But that I am forbid to tell the secrets of my prison house. I could a tale unfold whose lightest word would harrow up thy soul, freeze thy young blood, make thy two eyes like stars stop from their spheres. But this eternal blazon must not be the ears of flesh and blood. List, list, oh list! If thou didst ever thy dear father love, oh God, revenge his foul and most unnatural murder. Murder? Murder most foul is in the best it is, but this most foul, strange and unnatural. Haste me to know it, that I, with wings as swift as meditation, or thought of love, may sweep to my revenge. I find thee apt. Now, Hamlet, here, tis given out, sleeping in my orchard, a serpent stung me. So the whole ear of Denmark is by a forged process of my death rightly abused. But know, thou noble youth, the serpent that did sting thy father's life, now wears his crown. O oh, my prophetic soul, my uncle. Aye, that incestuous, that adulterate beast, with witchcraft of his wit, with treacherous gifts. Oh, wicked wit, gifts that have the power to seduce, one to the shameful lust, the will. My most seeming virtuous queen. Oh, Hamlet, what a falling off was there, and to decline upon a wretch whose natural gifts were born of those of mine. But soft, methinks I sent the morning air. Brief let me be, sleeping in my orchard, my custom always of the afternoon. Upon my secure hour, thy uncle stole with the juice of cursed Hebana in a vial and in the porches of mine ears did pour the leprous distillment, whose effect holds such an enmity with blood of man that swift as quicksilver it courses through the natural gates and alleys of the body, and with a sudden vigor it doth descent and curd like eager droppings in the milk, the thin and wholesome blood. So did it mine. Thus was I, slipping by a brother's hand of life, of crown, of queen, at once dispatched, cut off even in the blossoms of my sins, unhouseled, disappointed, unannealed, no reckoning made but set to my account with all my imperfections in my head. Oh, horrible! If thou hast nature in thee, bear it not. Let not the royal bed of Denmark be a couch for luxury and damned incest. But, howsoever thou pursuest this act, taint not thy mind, nor let thy soul contrive against thy mother aught. Leave her to heaven and to those thorns that in her bosom lodge to prick and sting her. I fare thee well at once. The glowworm shows the matter to be near, and gins to pale his ineffectual fire. Adieu, adieu, adieu. of heaven, O oh earth, what else? And shall I couple hell? Hold, hold my heart. And you, my sinews, grow not instant old, but bear me stiffly up. Remember thee, I, thou poor ghost, while memory, 
holds a seat in this distracted globe. Remember thee? Yea. From the table of my memory, I'll wipe away all trivial fond records, all saws of books, all forms, all pressures past, that youth and observation copied there. And thy commandment all alone shall live within the book and volume of my brain, unmixed with baser matter. Yes, by heaven! O oh, most pernicious woman, O oh, villain, villain, smiling, damned villain, my tables meet it as I set it down, that one may smile and smile and be a villain. At least I am sure it may be so in Denmark. So, uncle, there you are. Now to my word, it is adieu, adieu, remember me. I have sworn it. My lord, my lord! What have it? Hello, oh, my lord. Hello, oh, come here, come. Tell us, my lord. What news, my lord? Oh, wonderful. Good, my lord, tell it. No, you will reveal it. Not I, my lord, by heaven. No, my lord. How say then? Would heart of man once think it? But you'll be secret. I will have my lord. There's never a villain dwelling in Denmark, but he's an errant knave. If there needs no ghost, my lord, come from the grave to tell us this. Why, right? You are in the right, and so, without more circumstance at all, I hold it fit that we shake hands and part. You, as your business and desire, shall point you, for every man hath business and desires. For my part, look you, I'll go pray. These are but wild and whirling words, my lord. I am sorry they offend you heartily. Yes, faith heartily. There's no offense, my lord. Yes, by St. Patrick. But there is, Horatio, touching this vision here. It is an honest ghost that let me tell you, for your desire to know what it is between us, overmastered as you may. And now, good friends, as you are friends, scholars, and soldiers, give me one poor request. What is it, my lord, we will? Never make known your have seen tonight. My lord, we will not. Nay, but swear it. In faith, my lord, not I. No, my lord. Upon my sword. My lord, we have sworn already. Indeed, upon my sword, indeed. Ha! Say'st thou so? Art thou true, Penny? Come on! Come on! You hear this fellow in the cellarage? Consent to swear! Close the oath, my lord! Never speak of this that you have seen! Swear by my sword! Swear! And get ubi quay! Then we'll shift our ground! Come hither, gentlemen! Lay your hands again upon my sword! Never to speak of this that you have seen! Swear by my sword! Swear! Strange. And therefore, as a stranger, give it welcome. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. But come, here is before never so help you mercy. No strange or odd to ever I bear myself, is I perchance hereafter shall think meet to put an antique disposition on, that you, at such time as seeing me, never shall, with arms encumbered thus, or this hedging, or by pronouncing of some doubtful phrase as well, well, we know her. We couldn't if we would, or if we list to speak, or if they be, and if they might, or such a vigorous giving out to note that you know aught of me. This is not to do. So grace and mercy at your most need to help you swear. 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 Rest, rest, for the red spirit. So, gentlemen, with all my love, I do commend to you. And what so poor a man as Hamlet is may do it. Express his love and friending to you. God willing, shall not lack. Nay, let us go in together. And your fingers still on your lips, I pray. This time is out of joint. Oh, cursed spite. That ever I was born to set it right. Then goes the link to all his arms. 
and with his other hand thus over his brow, he falls to such perusal of my face, as if he were to draw it. Long stay he so, a little shaking of mine arm, and thrice his head thus waving up and down. He raised a sigh, so piteous and profound, as to shatter all of his bulk and end his being. That done, he lets me go. And with the last bending their light on me, he found his way out the door. Come, I will go seek the king. This is the very ecstasy of love. I am sorry. What, have you given him any hard words of late? No, my lord, but as you did command, I denied him access to me and I repelled his letters. That hath made him mad. Come, go we to the king. This must be known. Come. Gild and stern. Moreover, that we much did long to see you, the need to use you did provoke our hasty sending. Something have you heard of Hamlet's transformation? So I call it, since nor the exterior nor the inward man resembles that it was what it should be, more than his father's death that thus has put him so much from the understanding of himself that cannot dream of. I entreat you both, that being of so young days brought up with him, and since so neighbored to his youth and hair, that you vouchsafe your rest here in our court some little time, so by your companies to draw him on to pleasures, and to gather so much as from occasion you may glean whether aught to us unknown afflicts him thus, there open lies within our remedy. Good gentlemen, he hath much talk to do, and sure I am two men that are not living to whom he more appears. If it will please you to show us so much gentry and goodwill as to expend your time with us a while for the supply and profit of our hope, your visitation shall receive such thanks as fits a king's remembrance. Both your majesties might, by the sovereign power you have of us, put your dread pleasures more into command than entreaty. But we both know that, and here we give up ourselves in the full bed. Clare services freely, I would be, to be commanded. Thanks, Rosencrantz, and gentle Guildenstern. Thanks, Guildenstern, and gentle Rosencrantz. And I beseech you instantly to visit my too much changed son. Go, some of you, and bring these gentlemen where Hamlet is. Heavens make our presence and our practices helpful and pleasant to him. Aye, amen. Ah, oh, my liege. I have found the very cause of Hamlet's lunacy. Oh, speak of that, that do I long to hear. I doubt it is no other than the main, his father's death and our over-hasty marriage. Well, we shall sift him. My liege and madam, to expostulate what majesty should be, what duty is, why day is day, night is night, and time is time. We're nothing but to waste night, day, and time. Therefore, since gravity is the soul of wit and tediousness the out limbs and outward flourishes, I will be brief. Your noble son is mad. Mad call I it, for to define true madness, what is it but to be nothing else but mad? But let that go. More mad with less art. Madam, I swear I use no heart at all that he is mad. Tis pity and pity tis, tis true. A foolish figure, but farewell. For I will use no art. Mad let us grant him then, and now remains that we find out the cause of this effect, or rather say, the cause of this defect. For this effect defective comes by cause. It thus it remains in the remainder of us. Her pen. I have a daughter, while well, she is mine, who in her duty and obedience mark hath given me this. Now gather and surmise. <clears throat> to the celestial and my soul's idol, the most beautified Ophelia. That's an ill phrase, a vile phrase. Beautified is a vile phrase, but you shall hear thus. In her excellent white bosom. Came this from him to her? Good madam, stay a while. I will be faithful. Doubt thou the stars are fire. Doubt truth to be a liar, but never doubt I love. Oh dear Ophelia, I am ill at these numbers. I have not art to reckon my groans, but that I love thee best, O oh, most best. Believe it, adieu. Thine evermore, most dear lady, whilst this machine is unto him, Hamlet. This, in obedience, hath my daughter shown me, and moreover hath his solicitings, as they fell out by means, by time and place, all given to my ear. But how has she received his love? <laughs> what do you think of me? As of a man faithful and honorable. 
I would fain prove so, but what might you think when you had seen this hot love on the wing? What might you think? No. I went round to work, and my young mistress thus I did bespeak. Lord Hamlet is a prince, out of thy star. This must not be. And I prescripts gave her that she should lock herself from his resort, admit no messengers, receive no tokens. Which done, she took the fruits of my advice, and he, repulsed, short tale to make, fell into a sadness, then to a fast, thence to a watch, thence into a weakness, thence to a lightness, and by this declension into the madness wherein he now raves, and we all mourn for it. Do you think it is this? It may be very light. How may we try it further? You know, sometimes he walks for hours together here in the lobby. So he does indeed. At such a time, I'll lose my daughter to him. Be you and I behind in errors then, mark the encounter. If he love her not, and he not from his reason fallen thereon, let me be no assistant for a state, keep a farm and carters. We will try it. But look, we're sadly, the poor wretch comes reading. Away, I do beseech you both away. Give me leave, I'll board him presently. <clears throat> How does my good lord hand? Well, God of mercy. Do you know me, my lord? Ah, excellent well. You are a fishmonger. Not I, my lord. Then I would you were so honest, sir man. Honest, my lord? I, sir. To be honest, as this world goes, it is to be one man picked out of ten thousand. It's very true, my lord. For if the sun green maggots and a dead dog, have you a daughter? I have, my lord. Let her not walk in the sun. Conception is a blessing, but not as your daughter may conceive. Friend, look to it. How say you by that, still harping on my daughter? Yet he knew me not at first. He said I was a fishmonger. <laughs> he is far gone, far gone. And truly, in my youth, I suffered much extremity for love very near this. I'll speak to him again. What do you read, my lord? Words, words, words. What's the matter, my lord? Between who? I mean, the matter that you read, my lord. Slander, sir. For the satirical rogue says here that old men have gray beards, that their faces are wrinkled, their eyes purging thick amber and plum tree gum, and have a plentiful lack of wit, together with most weak ham. All which, sir, do I most powerfully and potently believe, though I hold it not honesty to have it thus set down. For you yourself, sir, should be as old as I am if, like a crab, you could go backward. <laughs> Though will this be madness, yet there is a method in it. <laughs> will you walk out of the air, my lord? Into my grave? Indeed, that is out of the air. Pregnant sometimes his replies are. My lord, almost humbly take my leave of you. You cannot. Take from me that I will more willingly part with all. <laughs> except my life. Except my life. Except my life. Fare you well, my lord. These tedious old fools. Go to seek the Lord Hamlet. There he is. God save you, sir. My honored lord! My most dear lord! My excellent good friends! How dost thou kill sir? Ah, Rosencrantz! Good lads, how do ye both? As the indifferent children of the earth. Happy that we are not over happy. On fortune's cap, we are not the merry button. Nor the soles of her shoe? Neither, my lord. Then you live about her waist, or in the middle of her favors. Faith, her private sweet. <sighs> Secret part of fortune, oh, most true. She is a strumpet. What news? None, my lord, but that the world has grown honest. Then this doom say you. But your news is not true. Let me question more in particular. Which have you, my good friends, deserved at the hands of fortune that she sends you to prison hither? Prison, my lord? Denmark's a prison. Then is the world one? A goodly, a goodly one, in which there are many confines, wards, and dungeons. Denmark being one of the worst. Why then your ambition makes it one? It is too narrow for your mind. Oh, God. I could be bounded in a nutshell, and count myself a king of infinite space, were it not that I have bad dreams. Which dreams indeed are ambition, for the very substance of the ambitious is merely the shadow of a dream. The dream itself is but a shadow. Truly, and I hold ambition of so airy and lighted quality, it is but a shadow shadow. <laughs> Shall we to the court? For by my fay I cannot reason. We'll wait upon you. No such matter. I will not sort with the rest of my servants, for to speak to you like an honest man, I am most dreadfully attended. But, in the beaten way of friendship, what make you to Elsinore? To visit you, my lord. No other occasion. Beggar that I am, I am even poor in things. But I thank you. Were you not sent for? 
Is it your own inclining? Is it free visitation? Come deal just with me. Come, come, nay, speak. What should we say, my lord? Why, anything to the purpose? You were sent for. There is a kind of confession in your looks, which your modesties have not enough craft to color. I know the good king and queen have sent for you. To what end, my lord? I will tell you why. So shall my anticipation prevent your discovery. Your secrecy to the king and queen will no feather. I have of late, but wherefore I know not, lost all my mirth, forgotten all custom of exercises and in deeds. It goes so heavily with my disposition that this goodly frame, the earth, why it appeareth no other thing to me than a foul and petulant congregation of vapors. What a piece of work is man! How noble in reason, how infinite in faculties, in form and moving, how express and admirable, in action, how like an angel, in apprehension, how like a god, the beauty of the world, the paragon of animals. And yet, to me, what is this quintessence of dust? Man delights not me, no, nor woman neither. So by your smile, you seem to say so. My lord, there is no such stuff in my thoughts. Why did you laugh then, when I said, man delights not me? To think, my lord, if you delight not in men, what length and entertainment the players shall receive from you. We coated them on the way, and hither are they coming to offer you sir. He that plays the king shall be welcome. His majesty shall have tribute of me. The humorous man shall end his part in peace. The clown shall make those laugh whose lungs are tickled over the stair. And the lady shall say her mind freely or the blank verse shall halt for it. Well be with you, gentlemen. I will prophesy. He comes to tell me of the players. Mark it. My lord, I have news to tell you. My lord, I have news to tell you. When Russius was an actor in Rome, the actors are come hither, my lord. Buzz, buzz. Upon my honor, the best actors in the world for tragedy, comedy, history, pastoral, pastoral comical, tragical historical, tragical comical, scene individable, poem unlimited, etc., etc., etc. We'll even do it like French falconers. Fly anything we see. We'll have a speech straight. Come, give us a taste of your quality. Come, come. A passionate speech. What speech, my lord? Um, I heard thee speak me a speech once. It was never acted. Or if it was, it pleased not the million. T'was Aeneas' tale to Dido, and thereabout especially where he speaks of Priam's slaughter. If it live in your memory, begin at this line. The rugged Pyrrhus, like the Hyperion beast. Wait, tis not so. Wait, it begins with the Pyrrhus, the rugged Pyrrhus, he whose sable arms roasted in wrath and fire, with eyes like carbuncles, the hellish Pyrrhus, old grandsire Priam seeks. So proceed. Nod and finds him, striking to short Greeks, his antique sword, rebellious to his arm. Lies where it falls, repugnant to command. Unequal match, Pyrrhus and Priam drives, and rage strikes wide. But with the whiff and wind of his fell sword, the unnerved father falls. Then senseless Ilium, seeming to feel this blow with flaming top, stoops to his base, and with a hideous crash, takes prisoner Pyrrhus's ear. For lo! His sword was declining in the milky head of Reverend Priam. See, in the air to stick. So as a painted tyrant to Pyrrhus stood, and like a neutral to his will and matter, did nothing. But, as we often see against some storm, a silence in the heavens, the wrath stands still. The bold wind speechless, and the orb below is hush as death. Anon the dreadful thunder doth rend the region. So after Pyrrhus's pause, aroused vengeance sets him to do a work. And never did the Cyclops' hammers fall on Mars's arm forged for proof to turn. With less remorse than Pyrrhus's bleeding sword now falls on Priam. This is too long. 
You chow to the barbers with your beard. Crippy, say on. He's for Jager, tell of Baudry, or he sleeps. Say on, come to Hecuba. But who, oh who, can see in the mobile queen? The mobile queen? That's good. The mobile queen is good. Fun barefoot, up and down, threatening the flames. With bis and woo, a clout on that head, where late the diadem stood. Four row about her leg and all the turned loins. Fleck it, the alarm of fear caught up. But if the gods themselves did see her then, when she saw Pyrrhus make malicious sport and mincing with his sword her husband's limbs, the instant boast of clamor that she made, unless things mortal move them not at all, would have made milch the burning eyes of heaven and passion in the gods. Look where he has not turned his color and has tears in his eyes. Pretty no more. Tis well. I'll have thee speak the rest of this soon. Good my lord, will you see these players well bestowed? Do you hear? Let them be well used. My lord, I will use them according to their desert. God help you, man, much better. Use every man after your own desert. And who should escape whipping? Use every man after your own honor and dignity. The less they deserve, the more merit is in your bounty. Take them in. Come, sirs. Dost thou hear me, old friend? Can you play the murder of Gonzaga? Aye, my lord. We'll hear play tomorrow. You could indeed study a speech of some dozen or sixteen lines which I would set down and insert in it. Could you not? Aye, my lord. Very well. Follow that lord. But look you, mock him not. <laughs> my friends, I will leave you till night. You are welcome to Elsinore. Is it not monstrous that this player here, but in fiction, in a dream of passion, could force his soul so to his own conceit, that from her working all his visage won, tears in his eyes, distraction in his aspect, a broken voice and his whole function soothing with forms to his conceit, and all for nothing. For Hecuba, what's Hecuba to him or he to Hecuba, that he should weep for her? What would he do had he the motive and cue for passion that I have? He would drown the stage with tears and cleave the general ear with horrid speech. Make mad the guilty and appall the free, confound the ignorant, and amaze indeed the very faculties of eyes and ears, yet I? A dull and muddy metal rascal peak. Like John who dreams, unpregnant of my cause, and can say nothing. No, not for a king upon whose property and most dear life a damned defeat was made. Am I a coward? Who calls me villain? Breaks my pate across, plucks off my beard, and blows it in my face? Tweaks me by the nose, and gives me the lie in the throat as deep as to the lungs? Who does me this, huh? Soon I should take it, for it cannot be but I am pigeon livered and lack gall. To make oppression bitter, or ere this I should have fatted all the region's kites with this slave awful. Oh bloody body villain, remorseless, treacherous, lecherous, kindless villain of vengeance! <laughs> Why, what an ass am I? This is most brave that I, the son of a dear father murdered, prompted to my revenge by heaven and hell, must, like a whore, unpack my heart with words and fall at cursing like a very drab, a scullion about my brain. I have heard that guilty creatures sitting at a play have by the very cunning of the scene been struck so to the soul that presently they have proclaimed their malefactions. For murder, though it have no tongue, will speak with most miraculous organ. I'll have these players play something like the murder of my father before mine uncle. I'll observe his looks, I'll tend him to the quick. If he but blench, I know my course. The spirit that I've seen may be a devil, and the devil hath power to assume a pleasant shape, yea, and perhaps out of my weakness and melancholy, 
as he is very potent with such spirits, abuses me to damn me. I'll have grounds more relative than this. The play's the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. Get from him why he puts on this confusion, writing so harshly all his days of quiet with turbulent and dangerous lunacy. He does confess he feels himself distracted, but from what cause he will by no means speak. Nor do we find him bored to be sounded, but with a crafty madness keeps him aloof when we bring him on to some confession of his true state. Did you say him to any pastime? Madam, it so fell out that certain players we overcame on the way. Of these we told him, and there did seem in him a kind of joy to hear of it. They're here about the court, and as I think, they have already ordered this night to play before him. Tis most true, and he beseeched me to entreat your majesties <coughs> to hear and see the matter. For with all my heart, and it does much content me to hear him so inclined. <coughs> Good gentlemen, give him a further edge and drive his purpose on these delights. We shall, my lord. Sweet Gertrude, leave us too, for we have closely sent for Hamlet hither that he, as it were by accident, may hear our front Ophelia. Her father and myself, lawful espials, will so bestow ourselves that, seen unseen, we may of their encounter frankly judge and gather by him as he is behaved, if it be the affliction of his love, or know that thus he suffers for. I shall obey you. And for your part, Ophelia, I do wish that your good beauties be the happy cause of Hamlet's wildness. So shall your good virtues bring him to his wanted way again, to both your honors. Madam, I wish it may. Ophelia, I brought you here. Christian, so please you, we will bestow ourselves. Read on this book that so show of such an exercise may color your loneliness. I hear him coming. Let's withdraw, my lord. against a sea of troubles, and by opposing end them. To die, to sleep no more, and by a sleep to say we end the heartache, and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to, tis a consummation devoutly to be wished. To die, to sleep, to sleep. Perchance to dream. I there is the rub, for in that sleep of death what dreams may come, when we have shuffled off this mortal coil, must give us pause. There is the respect that makes calamity of so long life, for who would bear the whips and scorns of time? The oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contumely, the pangs of despised love, the insolence of office, the law's delay, and the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes. When he himself might his quietest make with a bare bodkin. Who would these fardels bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life but that the dread of something after death, the undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns, puzzles thy will? It makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of. Thus conscience does make cowards of us all. And thus the nail of hue of resolution is sicklied over with pale cast of thought. With this regard their currents turn awry and lose the name of action. Softy now. Ferrophilia. Nymph in thy orsons, be all my sins remembered. 
Good my lord, how does your honor for this many a day? I humbly thank you. Well, well, well. My lord, I have remembrances of yours that I have long longed to re-deliver. I pray you, receive them now. No, not I. I never gave you aught. My honored lord, you know right well you did. And with them a word sweet breath composed, that made the things more rich. Take these for the noble mind. Rich gifts. Wax poor. When givers prove unkind, there, my lord. Are you honest? My lord. Are you fair? What means your lordship? That if you be honest and fair, then your honesty would admit no discourse to your beauty. Could beauty, my lord, have better confidence than with honesty? I did love you once. Indeed, you made me believe so. You should not have believed me. For our virtue cannot so inoculate our old stock, but we shall relish of it. I loved you not. I was the more deceived. Get thee to a nunnery. Why wouldst thou be a breeder of sinners? I myself indifferent honest, but yet I could accuse me of such things that it were better my mother had not borne me. I am very proud. Revengeful, ambitious, with more offenses at my beck than I've thoughts to put them in, imagination to give them shape or time to act them in. What should such fellows as I do, crawling between earth and heaven? We are arid knaves all, believe none of us. Go thy ways to a nunnery. Oh, heavenly powers restore him. Where is your father? At home. Let the door be locked upon him, that he may play the fool in nowhere but in his own house. Farewell. I've heard of your paintings too. Well enough. God hath given you one face, and you make yourselves another. You dig, you amble, you lisp, you nickname God's creatures, and make your wantonness your ignorance. It hath made me mad, I say. We shall have no more marriages. Those that are married already, all but one shall live. The rest shall keep as they are. To a nunnery. Go. Love, his affections do not that way tend. Know what he spake, though it lacked form a little, was not like madness. There's something in his soul over which his melancholy sits on brood, and I do doubt the hatch and the disclose will be of some danger. For which to prevent, I have thus in quick determination set it down. He shall with speed to England for the demand of our neglected tribute. Happily the seas and countries different shall expel this something settled manner in his heart. When his brain still beating puts him thus from fashion of himself. What think you on it? It shall be well, but yet I do believe the origin and commencement of his grief sprung from neglected love. How now, Ophelia? You need not tell us what the Lord Hamlet said. We heard it all. My lord, do as you please, but if you hold it fit after the play, let his lone mother entreat him in his closet. It shall be so. <coughs> Madness and great ones must not unwatched go. Oh, what a noble mind is here overthrown. The courtier, scholar, eye, tongue, sword, the glass of expectancy, in the rose of fair state, the observed of all observers, quite down, quite down. And I, of ladies most dejected and wretched, that suck the honey of his sweet music vows, now see the more noble and sovereign reason, like sweet bells jangling harsh and out of tune, the feature of blown ecstasy. Oh, woe is me to see what I have seen, to see what I see.
Can you hear this piece of work? And the queen too, and that president. Bid the players make haste. Will you two help hasten them? We will, my lord. What ho, Horatio? Here, sweet lord, at your service. There's a play tonight before the king. When scene of it comes near the circumstances of which I have told thee, of my father's death, I pray thee, when you seest that act afoot, even with the very comment of thy soul, observe my uncle. If his occulted guilt do not itself unkindle in one speech, it is a damned ghost that we have seen, and my imaginations are as foul as Vulcan Stippy. Give him a heedful note, for I mine eye will rivet to his face, and after we will both our judgments join in the center of his saving. Well, my lord. Get your place. You cannot feed Cape on so? I have nothing with this answer, Hamlet. These words are not mine. Nor mine now. Be the players ready? My lord, they stay upon your patience. Come hither, my dear Hamlet. Sit by me. No good mother. Here is a metal more attractive. Oh, ho, you mark that. Lady, shall I lie in your lap? No, my lord. I mean, my head upon your lap. Aye, my lord. That's a fair thought to lie between a maid's legs. What is my lord? Nothing. You are merry, my lord. Who, I? I, my lord. Oh, God, you're only a jig maker? What should a man do but be merry? For look you how cheerfully my mother looks, and my father died within two hours. Nay, just twice two months, my lord. So long? Oh, heaven died two months ago and not forgotten yet? Then there is hope that a great man's memory may outlive his life half a year. You're not, you're not, all marks the play. <laughs> for us, and for our traps, look at the king. For us, and for our tragedy, here, stooping to your clemency, we beg your hearing patiently. Is this the prologue or the posy of a ring? Tis brief, my lord. As woman's love? Well, thirty times have first and sacred bands gone round, since love our hearts and hymen did our hands, unite the mutual in most sacred bands. So many journeys may the sun and moon make us again, count over ear, love be done. Faith, I must leave thee, love, and shortly too. My awkward powers their functions leave to do, and thou shalt live in this fair world behind, honored, beloved, and happily one's kind. For husband Oh, confound! Such love must needs be treason in my breast. When second husband let me be a curse, none wed the second, but who killed the first. A second time I kill my husband dead, when second husband kisses me in bed. I do believe you think, but now you speak. But what we do determine, oft we break. So think thou wilt no second husband wed, but die thy thoughts when thy first lord is dead. Nor earth to give me food, nor heaven light, sport and repose lock from me day, and night, both here and hence, pursue me lasting strife, if once a widow, ever I be a wife. If she should break it now. Tis deeply sworn, sweet. Now leave me here a while, in vain I would beguile a tedious day with sleep. Sleep rock by thy brain, and never become mischance between us twain. Madam, how will I give this play? The lady doth protest too much, she thinks. <laughs> oh, but she'll keep her word. Have you heard the argument? Is there no offense in it? No, no. They do but jest. Poison in the jest. No offense in the world. You are as good as a corpse, my lord. I could call a play. The mousetrap. Tis a knavish piece of work. But what of that, your majesty? We of us that have free souls, it touches us not. I could interpret between you and your love if I could see the puppets dallying. You are keen, my lord, you are keen. Would you cost you groaning to take off my edge? Still better and worse. You must take your husbands. Begin, murder. Thoughts black, hands act, 
drugs fit in time of green. Thou mixture rank of midnight weeds collected. Unwholesome life you serve immediately. You shall see anon how the murderer gets the love of Gonzago's wife. The king rises! What? Frighted with false fire? How fares my lord? Give over the play. Give me some light away. Light, light, light. Oh, good Horatio. I'll take that ghost word for a thousand pounds. Didst perceive? Very well, my lord. Upon the top of the poison inn. I did very well note him, my lord. Come to the poor quarters. Come to music. Come to the low quarters. My lord, vouchsafe me a word with you. Sir, a whole history. The king, sir. I, sir, what of him? Is in his retirement, marvelous distempered. With drink, sir. No, my lord, rather with choler. My lord, put your discourse into some frame and start not so wildly from my affair. I am tame, sir. Pronounce. The queen, your mother, in most great affliction of spirit, has sent me to you. You are welcome. Nay, this courtesy is not of the right breed. If it shall please you to make me a wholesome answer, I shall do your mother's commandment. If not, your pardon in my return to the end of my business. Sir, I cannot. What, my lord? Make you a wholesome answer, my wits disease. My mother, you say? Then thus she said, your behavior has struck her into amazement and admiration. A wonderful son that can so astonish a mother. She desires to speak with you in her closet ere you go to bed. We shall obey, were she ten times our mother. My lord, have you any further trade with us? My lord, you once did love me. And I do still by these pickers and stealers. My lord, what is your cause of distemper? You do surely bar the doors upon your own liberty if you deny your grief to your friends. Sir, I lack advancement. How can that be when you have the voice of a king himself for your succession in Denmark? Oh, the records. Let me see one. Thank you very much. To withdraw you. Why do you go about to recover the wind of me? As if you were to drive me into a toil. Oh, my lord, if my duty be too bold, my love is too unmannerly. I do not well understand that. Will you play upon this pipe? I cannot. I pray you. Believe me, I cannot. I do beseech you. I know no touch of it. It is as easy as lying. Govern these vintages with your fingers and thumbs. Give it breath from your mouth, and it will discourse most eloquent music. Look you, these are the stops. But these cannot, I command, to any utterance of harmony. I've not the skill. Why, look you now. How unworthy a thing you would make of me. You would play upon me. You would seem to know my stops. You would pluck at the heart of my misery. You would sound me from my lowest note to the top of my compass. And there's much music. Excellent voice in this little organ. Yet cannot you make it speak? Splut, do you think I am easier to be played upon than a pipe? Call me what instrument you will. Though you can fret me, you cannot play upon me. God bless you, sir. My lord, the queen would speak with you, and presently. I will come to my mother by and by. I will go by and by. I will say so. By and by is easily said. Leave me, friends. Tis now a very witching time of night, when churchyards yawn, and hell itself breathes out contagion to this world. Now could I drink hot blood, and do such bitter business as a day that would quake to look on. Soft, now to my mother. I will speak daggers to her, but use none. My tongue and soul in this be hypocrites. However, in my words, whomever she be shent, to give them seals never, my soul's consent. Dispatch, and he to England shall along with you. The terms of our estate may not endure hazard so near us as does hourly grow out of lunacies. We will ourselves provide, most holy and religious spirit is, to keep those many, many bodies safe that live and feed upon your majesty. Never alone did the king sigh, but with a general groan. Arm you, I pray you do this speedy voyage, for we will fetters put upon this fear which now goes too free footed. Lord, 
He's going to his mother's closet. Behind the arrows, I'll convey myself to hear the process. I'll warrant she'll tax him home. Fare you well, my leech. Call upon you ere you go to bed, and tell you what I know. Thanks, dear my lord. My offense is rank. It smells to heaven. It hath the primal eldest curse upon it. A brother's murder. Then can I not? Though inclination be as sharp as will, my strong guilt defeats my strong intent, and like a man to double business bound, I stand in pause where I shall first begin and both neglect. What if this cursed hand were thicker than itself with brother's blood? Is there not rain enough in the sweet heavens to wash it white as snow? But oh, what form of prayer can serve my turn? Forgive me my foul murder? That cannot be, since I am still possessed of those effects for which I did the murder. My crown, mine own ambition, and my queen. May one be pardoned and retain the offense? And the corrupted currents of this world, offense's gilded hand may shove by justice, and oft it seems the wicked prize itself buys out the law. But tis not so above. There is no shuffling. There the action lies in its true nature, and we ourselves compelled even to the teeth and forehead of our faults to give in evidence. But then, what rests? Try what repentance can, what can it not? Yet, what can it when one cannot repent? Oh, wretched state, bosom black as death, Alive in soul that's struggling to be free or more engaged. Help! Angels! Make a say! Bow, stubborn knees, and heart with strings of steel. Be as soft as the sinews of the newborn babe. All may be well. Now might I do it. Pat! Now he is praying, now I'll do it! And so he goes to heaven, that would be scanned. A villain kills my father, and for that I, his sole son, send the same villain to heaven? Why, this is higher in salary, not revenge. He took my father grossly. Full of bread, with all his crimes broad blown his flesh is made. And how his audit stands, who knows save heaven? Tis heavy with him, and then am I revenged to take him in the purging of his soul when he is fit and seasoned for this passage? No. Know thou a more horrid hint. When he is drunk asleep, or in rage, or in the incestuous pleasure of his bed, at gaming, swearing, or about some act that has no relish of salvation in it, then trip him, that his heels may kick at heaven, but his soul may be as damned and as black as hell. Where to it goes, my mother stays. This physic but prolongs thy sickly days. My words fly up, my thoughts remain below. Words without thoughts never to heaven go.
Man, he will come straight. Look you lay home to him. Tell him his pranks have been too broad to bear with, and your grace has stood and screamed between much eating him. I'll silence me even here. Pray you be round. Mother! 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 Oh, Lord, you fear me not, which all I hear him coming. Now, Mother, what's the matter? Him with the house, thy father much offended. Mother, you have my father much offended. Come, come, you enter with an idle tongue. Go, go, you question with a wicked tongue. Why, how now, Hamlet? What's the matter now? Have you forgot me? No, by the root, not so. You're the queen, your husband's brother's wife. And would the word not so, you're my mother. Nay, then I'll set those to you who can speak. Come, come and sit me <laughs> down. Let me bring your heart, so that you may see the inmost part of yourself. Well, what the devil is that murder me? Help, help, help! What? Oh, help, help, help! How now? A rat! Dead for ducking, dead! <gasps> oh, me? What hast thou done? Nay, I know not. Is it the king? Oh, what a rash and bloody deed is this! A bloody deed! Almost as bad, good mother, as kill a king and marry with his brother! As kill a king? Aye, lady, that was my word. Oh. 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 I am slain. The wretched rash, intruding fool, farewell! I took thee for thy better. Take thy fortune. Leave wringing of your hands. Peace take you down. Let me wring your heart. For so I shall if it be made of penetrable stuff. What have I done that thou darest wag thy tongue and so rude against me? Such an act that blurs the grace and blush of modesty, calls virtue hypocrite, mm. takes off the rose from the forehead of an innocent love, and sets a blister there. Ah, oh, me, what act? The roar so loud and thunders in the index. Look here upon this picture. And on this, the counterfeit presentment of two brothers. See what grace was seated on this brow? Hyperion's curls, the front of Jove himself, an eye like Mars to threaten in command? This was your husband. Look you now what followed, like a mildewed ear blasting his wholesome brother. Have you eyes? Could you on this fair mountain leave to feed and batten in this moor? Huh? Have you eyes? You cannot call it love. For at your age, the heyday in the blood, it's tame. It's humble and waits upon the judgment. And what judgment would step from this to this? Oh, shame, where is thy bluss? Oh, Hamlet, thou, thou turnest mine eyes with my very soul. And there I see such black and green spots as will not leave their taint. Nay, but to live? In the rank sweat of an unseemed bed, stewed in corruption, honeying and making love over the nasty sty. It would speak to me no more. That turns my eyes into my very soul. A murderer and a villain, a slave that is not twentieth part of the tithe of your president, lord. A vice of kings, a cutpurse of the empire and the rule that from the shelf the precious diadem stole and put in his pocket. No more. A king of shreds and patches. Save me and hover over me with your wings. Your heavenly guards, what should your gracious figure? Do not come your tardy son to chide. Lapse in time and passion lets go by. The important acting of your dread command, oh say. Do not forget. This visitation is but to wet thy almost blunted purpose. But look, amazement on thy mother sits. Oh, step between her and her fighting soul. Conceited, weakest body, strongest work, so speak to our Hamlet. How is it with you, lady? Alas, how is it with you that you defend your eye on vacancy? And with the incorporate air do hold discourse, O oh, gentle son, upon the heat and flame of thy distemper, sprinkle cool patience. Whereon do you look? On him, on him, look you how pale he glares, his form and cause conjoined. Do not look upon me, lest with this piteous action you convert my stern effects. To whom do you speak this? Do you see nothing there? No, nothing at all, yet all that is I see. Nor did you nothing here? No, nothing but ourselves. Look how it seals away. My father, in his heaven as he lived, 
Even now, out at the portal. This is the very coinage of your brain. This bodiless creation of ecstasy is very coming in. Ecstasy? Ecstasy? My pulse, as your thought temperately keeps time and makes its healthful music. It is not madness that I've uttered, mother. For love of grace, lay not the flattering unction to your soul, that not your trespass, but my madness speaks. And do not spread the compost on the weeds to make them ranger. Oh, him, thou hast cleft my heart in twain. Oh, throw away the worser part of it and live the pure with the other half. Good night. But go not to my uncle's bed. Assume a virtue if you have it not. When you are desirous to be blessed, I'll blessing beg of you. For this same Lord I do repent, but heaven hath pleased it so. To punish me with this and this with me, I will answer well the death I have given him. One word more, good lady. What shall I do? Not this. No, by no means that I bid you do. Let the bloat king tempt you again to his bed, pinch wanton on your cheeks, call you his little mouse, or for a pair of reedy kisses are paddling in your neck with his damned fingers to make you rattle all this matter out, that I essentially am not in madness, but mad in craft. Be thou assert, if words be made of breath and breath of life, I have no life to breathe what thou hast said to me. I must to England, you know that. Alack, I had forgot, just so concluded on. There are letters shield, my two school fellows who I will trust and will Anders famed. They bear the mandate and sweep and marshal me to knavery. This man shall set me packing. I'll lug the guts into the neighbor room. Indeed, this counsel is most still, most secret and most grave. Who was in life a foolish prating knave? Come, sir, withdraw we'll toward an end with you. Good night, mother. Mm sent to seek him and to find the body. How dangerous is that, is it that this man goes loose? How now? What is befallen? Where the dead body is bestowed, my lord, we cannot get from him. But where is he? Without, my lord, guarded to know your pleasures. Bring him before us. Jonestown, bring him, my lord. Now, Hamlet, where's Polonius? At supper. At supper? Where? Not where he eats, but where he is eaten. Where is Polonius? In heaven. Send a messenger there to see, but if your messenger find him not there, then you shall seek him in the other place yourself. But indeed, <laughs> if you find him not within this month, you shall nose him as you go up the stairs and into the lobby. Go, seek him there. He will stay till you come. Hamlet, this deed for thine especial safety, which we do tender as which we dearly grieve for that which thou hast done, must send thee hence with fiery quickness. The bark is ready and the wind at help. The associates tend and everything is bent for England. For England? Aye, Hamlet. Good. So is it, if thou knewest our purposes? I see a cherub that sees them. But come, for England! Farewell, dear mother. Thy loving father, Hamlet. My mother. Father and mother is man and wife. Man and wife is one in flesh. And so, my mother. Come for England. Follow him at foot. Tempt him with speed aboard. Delay it not. I'll have him hence tonight. Away, for everything is sealed and done that else leans on the affair. 
freedom of case. And England, if my love thou holdst it aught, mayest thou not coldly set our sovereign process, which imports it full by letters congruing to that effect the present death of Hamlet. Do it, England, for like the hectic in my blood he rages, and thou must cure me till I know it is done. However, my haps, my joys were never begun. Says she hears there's tricks in the world and hymns and beats her heart. Indeed, would make one think there might be thought, though nothing sure yet much unhappily. First, the beauteous majesty of Denmark. How now, Ophelia? Single spies, but in battalions. Let him in! Let him in! Let him in! Where are my shirts? Let him go on the door. How now? What news? Save yourself, my lord. Young Laertes, in a riotous head, overbears your offices. The rabble call him lord. That cry, Laertes shall be king. Laertes king. Let him in! Give me my father! Oh, that drop of blood that's come proclaims me bastard! Christ couple to my father! What is the cause, Laertes, that thy rebellion looks so giant-like? Let him go, Gertrude. Do not fear a person. Tell me, Laertes, why thou art thus incensed? Let him go, Gertrude. Speak, man. Where is my father? Dead. But not by him! Let him demand his fill. How came he dead? I'll not be juggled with. To hell allegiance, vows to the blackest devil. Let come what come, only I'll be revenged most thoroughly for my father. Who shall stay you? My will, not all the world. Good Laertes, if you desire to know the certainty of your dear father's death, is it written your revenge that sweepstake will draw both friend and foe, winner and loser? None but his enemy. 
enemies. Will you know them then? To his good friends, this wide I'll open my arms. Why, now you speak like a good child and a true gentleman. That I am guiltless of your father's death and am most sensibly in grief for it. It shall as level to your judgment pierce as day does to your eye. For you deny me right. Go but apart. Make choice of whom your wisest friends you will, and they shall hear and judge twixt you and me. If by direct or collateral hand they find us touched, we will our kingdom give, our life, our crown, and all that we call ours to you in satisfaction. But if not, be you content to lend your patience to us, and we shall jointly labor with your soul to give it due content. Let it be so. His means of death, his obscure funeral, no trophy, no sword, no hatchment over his bones, no formal right, nor formal ostentation. Cry to be heard as from heaven to earth that I must call it into question. So you shall, and where the offense is, let the great axe fall. I pray you go with me. Horatio, no, hear me, ere we were two days old at sea, and a pirate, a very warlike appointment gave us chase. Finding ourselves too slow of sail, we put on a compelled valor, and in the grapple I boarded them. On the instant they got clear of our ship, so I alone became their prisoner. They have dealt with me like thieves of mercy, but they knew what they did. I am to do a good turn for them. Let the king have the letters I have sent, and repair thou to me with as much haste as thou would fly death. I have words to speak in thine ear that will make thee dumb, yet are they much too light for the bore of this matter. Rosencrantz and Gildersen hold their course for England. Well, of them I have much to tell thee. Farewell. Interesting. Since you have heard, and with a knowing ear, that he which has your noble father slain pursued my life. And so have I, a noble father lost, and his sister driven to desperate terms, who, if praises may go back again, stood on a mountain, 
a challenger to all of the angels for her perfections. But I will have revenge for my father. Break not your sleeps for that. You must not think that we are made of stuff so flat and dull that we can let our beard be shook with danger and think it past time. You shortly shall hear more. I loved your father, and we love ourselves, and that I hope will teach you to imagine. Mm. How now? What news? It's from Hamlet. It's to your majesty and it's to the queen. From Hamlet? Laertes, you shall hear them. Leave us. High and mighty, you shall know I am set naked on your kingdom. Tomorrow I shall ask leave to see your kingly eyes, wherein I shall, first asking your pardon thereunto, recount the occasion of my sudden and more strange return. Hamlet, what should this mean? Are all the rest come back? Or is it some of you said no such thing? Know you the hand? It is Hamlet's character, naked. Here in a postscript, he says alone. Can you advise me? I am lost in it, my lord. But let him come. It warms for a sickness in my heart that I should live to tell it to his deed. T, thus didst thou. If it be so, Laertes, as how should it be so? How otherwise? Will you be ruled by me? I, my lord, you will not overrule me to a peace. To thine own peace. Laertes, was your father dear to you? Or are you like the painting of a sorrow, a face without a heart? Why ask you this? Hamlet comes back. What would you undertake to show yourself your father's son indeed more than in words? To cut his throat in the church. No place indeed should martyr sanctuize. Revenge should have no bounds. But good Laertes, will you do this? Keep close within your chamber. Hamlet returned shall know you are come home. We'll put on those who praise your excellence in a game of foils. Bring you and find together and wager on your heads. He being remiss, most generous and free from all contriving, will not peruse the foils so that with ease, or with little shuffling, you may choose the sword unbated, and in a passive practice, requite him for your father. I will do it. I bought an unction of a mountebank so guffed, so mortal, that if Gollum slightly, it may be death. I will touch my point with this contagion. Let's further think of this. When in your motion you are hot and dry, as to make your bouts more violent to that end, I'll have prepared him a chalice for the nonce, whereon but sipping, if he by chance escaped your venom stuck, our purpose may hold there. But stay, what noise? How now, sweet queen? When woe doth tread upon another's heel, so fast they follow. Your sisters drown, Laertes. Drown? Where? There is a willow grows a slant of brook. That shows his horror leaves in the glassy streams. There on pendant rose her cornet weeds, clamoring to hang. An envious sliver broke when down her weedy trophies in herself fell into the weeping brook. Her clothes spread wide, and mermaid like, a while they bore her up, which time she chaunted snatches of old tunes as one incapable of her own distress. Or like a creature, native and endued unto that element. But long it could not be, till that her garments, heavy with their drink, pulled the poor wretch from her melodious lay to muddy death. Alas, then she is drowned. Drowned, drowned. Too much water has poor Ophelia. Thus I forbid my tears. Adieu, my lord, I have speech of fire that fain would blaze, but this folly doubts it. Let's follow Gertrude. How much I had to do to calm his rage, I now fear this will give its start again. Therefore, let's follow.
buried in Christian burial when she willfully seeks her own salvation? I tell thee she is. Therefore make her grave straight. The crowner finds a Christian burial. How can that be? Unless she drowned herself in her own defense. Why, tis found so. It must be, say, offendendo. Cannot be else. Here lies the point. If I drown myself wittingly, or use an act, and an act has three branches. It is to act, to do, to perform. Argo, she drowned herself wittingly. Nay, but hear you, good man, Delver. Give me leave. Here lies the water. Good. Here stands the man. Good. If the man were to go to this water and drown him willy-nilly, he goes. Mark you that. But if the water were to come to this man and drown him, he that is not guilty for his own death, sure it's not his own life. But is this law? Aye, Mary. Will you have the truth on it? If this had not been a gentle woman, she would not have been buried in a Christian graveyard. Were there thou sayest, Pity that great folk in this world should have the countenance to drown or hang themselves more than their ordinary Christian. There was no ancient gentleman but gardeners, ditchers, and grape makers. Now get thee to yon and fetch me a stoop of liquor. Has this fellow no feeling of his business that he sings out of grave making? Custom hath made it in him a property of easiness. Whose grave is this, sir? Mine, sir. I think that'd be fine indeed. Without lies in it. You lie out on it, sir, for it is not yours. For my part, I lie in it, yet it is mine. Thou dost lie in it, to be in it and to say tis thine. Tis for the dead, not for the quick. Therefore you lie. Tis a quick lie, sir, and twill again from me to you. What man dost thou dig it for? For no man, sir. What woman, then? For none, neither. Who is to be buried in it? One that was a woman, sir, but rest her soul, she's dead. How absolute this knave is. <laughs> How long hast thou been a grave maker? I have been sexton here for man and boy thirty years. How long will a man lie in the dirt, airy rot? Well. This skull here hath lying in the earth three and twenty years. Whose was it? Horse of mad fellow. Who do you think it was? Nay, I know not. Pestilence on him, for a mad rogue. He poured a flagon of Rhenish on my head once. This same skull was Yorick skull. The gate jester. Aye, that. Oh my god, alas, poor Yorick! I knew him, Horatio. A fellow of infinite jest, of most excellent fancy. Where be your jibes now? Your gambols, your songs, your flashes of merriment that were wont to set the table on a roar. Not one to mock your own grinning. Quite chap fallen. Now get you to my lady's chamber and tell her, let her paint an inch thick. To this favor she must come. Make her laugh at that. What's off, what's off, aside. Here comes the king. Hamlet's wife. But hold off your dust a while. 
till that card once more in my arms. Now pile your dust upon the quick and dead until of this flat mountain you have made. What is he whose grief bears such an emphasis? This is I, Hamlet the Dane. The devil take thy soul. Pluck them asunder. Hamlet, Hamlet! Why, I will fight upon this thing until my eyelids no longer wag. Oh, son, what thing? <laughs> I loved Ophelia. Forty thousand brothers, with all their quantity of love, could not make up my son. What wilt thou do for her? Oh, he is mad, Laertes. Oh, for love of God, forbear him. Swoon, show me what thou do. Would weep, would fight, would fast, would tear thyself, drink easel, eat a crocodile, I'll do it. Comes here to whine, to outface with me, leaping in her grave, buried quick with her, and so will I. Hear you, sir. What is the reason you use me thus? I loved you ever, but it is no matter. Let Hercules himself do what he may. The cat will mew and the dog will have his day. This is mere madness, and thus a while the fit will work on him. I pray thee, good Horatio, wait upon him. Strengthen your patience in our last night's speech. We'll put the matter to the present push. Good Gertrude, set some watch over your son. This grave shall have a living monument. An hour of court, an hour of quiet, shortly shall we see. Until then, impatience our proceedings be. Remember it, my lord. Sir, in my heart there was a kind of fighting that would not let me sleep. Up from my cabin, my sea gown scarfed about me, groped I to find Rosencrantz and Gillingster, and in fine fingered their packet, and withdrew to my own room again, to unseal their grand commission. Where I found Horatio, an exact command that my head should be struck off. Is it possible? Here's the commission. Read it more at your leisure. <clears throat> Wilt thou bear how I did proceed? I beseech you. I sat me down and devised a new commission. Wilt thou know the effect of what I wrote? Aye, good my lord. An earnest conjuration from the king, as England was his faithful tributary, that in the knowing of these circumstances, without debatement further more or less, he should the bearers put to sudden death, not shriving time aloud. So, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead? Why, man, did they make love to this employment? Why they are not near my conscience. Why, what a king is this? And is it not to be damned, to let this canker of our nature come in further evil? I don't know, my lord. It will be short. The interim is mine, and a man's life is no more than to say one. Peace! Who comes here? Your lordship is right. Welcome back to Dilworm. I only thank you, sir. Dost thou know this waterfly? Uh, no, my lord. Sweet lord, if your lordship were at leisure, I should impart a thing to you from his majesty. I will receive it, sir, with all diligence of spirit. Put your bonnet to his right use, tis for the head. I thank your lordship. It is very hot. No, believe me. Tis very cold. The wind is northerly. It is indifferent cold, my lord, indeed. But yet, Methinks it is very sultry and hot for my complexion. Exceedingly, my lord, tis very sultry. As twere, I cannot tell how, but my lord, his majesty bade me signify to you that he has laid a great wager on your head. Sir, this is the matter. I beseech you remember. Nay, good my lord, in my knees and good faith. I know you are not ignorant of what excellence Laertes is. I dare not confess that, lest I should compare him with an excellence. But to know a man well were to know himself. I mean, sir, for his weapon. What's his weapon? Rapier and dagger. That's two of his weapons, but well. The king, sir, hath wagered with him six barbier horses, against the which he has imposed. As I take it, six French rapiers and poniards. Why is this all imposed, as you call it? 
The king, sir, has laid that in a dozen passes between yourself and him, he shall not exceed you three hits. He has laid on twelve or nine, and it would come to immediate trial if your lordship would vouchsafe the answer. Sir, I will walk here in the hall if it pleases majesty. Tis the very breathing time of day with me. Let the foils be brought, the gentleman willing, and the king hold his purpose. I will win for him if I can. If not, I will gain nothing but my shame in the odd hits. My duty to your honor. Yours, yours. You will lose his wager, my lord. I do not think so. Since he went into France, I have been in continual practice. I shall win out the odds. N but wouldst thou think how ill all's about my heart? But it is no matter. My lord, if your mind dislike anything, obey it. It is but foolery. It is a kind of gain-giving that would perhaps trouble any man. Obey it. I will forestall the repair hither. Not a whit. We defy augury. There's a special providence in the fall of a sparrow. If it be now, tis not to come. If it's not to come, it will be now. If it's not now, yet it will come. Then the readiness is all. For no man knows aught of what he leaves. What is it to leave betimes? Let be. Pardon, sir, for I have done you wrong, but pardon it is your gentleman. This presence knows, and you must needs have heard, how I am punished with sore distraction. What I have done, that might your nature, honor, and exception roughly away. I hear proclaim was madness. Sir, let my disclaiming from a purposed evil free me so far in your generous thoughts that I have shot my arrow over the house and hurt my brother. I am satisfied in nature, and do receive your offered love like love, and will not wrong you. And will this brother wager frankly play? Give us the foils, come on. Come on for me. Cousin Hamlet, you know the wager? Very well, my lord. Your grace has laid the odds on the weaker side. <laughs> I do not fear it. I have seen you both. But since he is better, we have therefore odds. Nay, this one is too heavy. Let me see another. This one likes me well. These foils of all the length. Aye, my lord. Bring me the wine. If Hamlet give the first or second hit, a quick answer for the third exchange, let all the battlements their ordnance fire. The king shall drink to Hamlet's better breath, and in the cup of pearl shall he throw richer than that which four kings in Denmark's crown and war. Come, begin, and you the judge, bear a wary eye. Come on, sir. Come, my lord. One. No. Judgment. A hit, a very palpable hit. Well, again. Stay, give me a drink. Hamlet, this pearl is thine. Here's to thy health. Give him the cup. I'll play this bout first. Set it up a while. Come on, sir. Ugh, another hit. What say you? A touch, a touch I do confess. Our son shall win. He is fat and scant of breath. Here, Hamlet. Take my napkin, rub thy brows. Good. The queen carouses to thy fortune, Hamlet. Gertrude, do not drink. I will, my lord. I pray you pardon me. It is the poison cup. It is too late. I dare not drink yet, madam. By and by. Come, let me wipe thy face. My lord, I'll hear it now. I do not think it. And yet it is almost against my conscience. Come for the third, Laertes. You but dally. Pray you pass with your best of violence. I'm afraid you make a wanton of me. Say you so? Come on. Nothing neither way. How about you now? Nay, come again. Look to the queen there! They bleed on both sides! Who is Laertes? Why is Rupcock to catch my own 
Catherine, I am just a kill. How's that going? She swims to see them bleed. No, no, the drink, the drink. Always you have with the drink, the drink. I am poisoned. Oh, villainy! Let the doors be locked! Treachery! Seek it out! Hamlet, it is here. Thou art slain. No medicine in the world could do thee good. In thee there is not half an hour of life. The treacherous instrument is in thy hand, unbated and in venom. The foul practice hath turned itself on me. Lo, here I lie, never to rise again. Thy mother's poisoned. I can no more. The king, the king is to blame. The point in venom too? Then venom to thy work. <laughs> oh, yet defend me, friends, I am but hurt. Here, thou incestuous, you murderous damned dame, drink off this potion. Is thy union here? Follow my mother. <laughs> he is justly served. This is a poison tempered by himself. Come, noble heaven, exchange forgiveness with me, so that my own and my father's death come not upon thee, nor thine on me. Heaven make thee free of it, and follow thee. <sighs> Thou wretched queen, adieu, you that look pale and tremble at this chance. Thou wert but mute in audience to this act. Had I but time as this fell surgeon's death is strict in his arrest. Oh, I could tell you, but let it be, Horatio. I am dead, thou livest. Report me in my cause aright to the unsatisfied. If thou didst ever hold me in thy heart, absent thee from felicity a while, and in this harsh world draw my breath in pain, to tell my story. The rest is silence. Now it cracks a noble heart. Good night, sweet prince, and let flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. <coughs> mm -hmm.